and certainly in Egypt and Tunisia, it will be the U.S. Treasury Department making the decisions. The IMF was their most important avenue of influence in developing countries, more than the military, more than the CIA, more than all their covert operations and their State Department programs. The IMF was the big one. Yeah, well, I think the main problem with the IMF, and, and the IMF is really the leader here, because they're the ones that make uh, macroeconomic policy. And the bank has a lot of power, mainly because it uh, allies with the IMF in most countries. And so that gives them kind of a creditor's cartel with other multilateral lenders. They're able to have a lot of influence in low-income countries. Uh, so uh, they've lost a lot of that power, you know. The Latin, Latin American countries have almost all gotten away from the IMF and don't borrow and don't listen to them. And the middle income countries after the Asian final, financial crisis, you know, South Korea and Taiwan and uh, Thailand, Philippines, they moved out too and didn't go back after their experience. Same for Russia. So they've lost mo a huge part of their power in the world over the last uh, decade. Um, but on the other hand, they have enormous resources now, but most of it's in Europe. And so what's the problem? I mean, the problem is they very often support policies that are damaging uh, or insist upon policies that are damaging to the economy. And these can be overly tight monetary policies, uh, overly tight fiscal policies, and then these structural reforms that they support where they try, where most of their reforms tend to weaken the power of labor and unions and uh, very often have the effect of redistributing income upward. And the privatizations, you know, um, and, you know, it really depends on the country. I mean, for a developing country, uh, they make it often more difficult for them to have any kind of a development strategy because they're generally against that. Well, right now, in the immediate uh, future, they're not uh, calling for anything drastic, but they do have a plan, an intermediate strategy, that I think could be very damaging. They want to, you know, the economy shrank by like 2.5% or 2.7% last year. You have 18 or 19% unemployment. And, uh, a lot of that, most of that is because of external shocks. You know, the people who were in Libya came home. That increases unemployment. But mostly Europe. You know, I think what IMF is doing most, ironically, to hurt the Tunisian uh, economy is what they're doing in Europe. Because you have most of your uh, investment comes from Europe. Uh, most of your exports go to Europe. Most of Tunisia's uh, remittances come from Europe. And so all of these things have been hit hard by the slowdown in the, in the Eurozone and in Europe generally. So that's hurting them more than anything in the immediate uh, context. But the plan they have going forward doesn't look very good either. Um, they, want to, uh, they want to shrink the uh, budget deficit to 2% by 2017. Now, when the economy is doing this badly, if they start to do that anytime soon, that's going to hurt. They want to tighten monetary policy as well. That could also uh, slow the economy. You know, and the problem is that Tunisia has a pretty big current account deficit. It's like 7.5% of GDP, or it was towards the end of the last year. And it's run low on reserves. So the IMF is going to have a lot of power unless Tunisia can find someone else uh, to lend them some reserves. It's not a lot of money. I mean, it would be great if they could get something from China or some other country that has a lot of reserves. Some of the Latin American governments that didn't want to do these kinds of things, you know, uh, have gotten quite a bit uh, from China, for example. Uh, there are other sources of, of, of reserves in the world today that didn't exist 10 years ago. And that's one of the reasons that the IMF has lost uh, some of its, its power.
you know, the program that they're going to propose, I mean, we don't have it yet because they're negotiating the standby arrangement right now uh, for something like $2 billion, so we don't know everything that's in it. But overall, I think it's, it's not going to be helpful. It will probably hurt the Tunisian economy. I mean, in their, in their last consultation with Tunisia in September in the Article 4, you know, they say things like, we want to make sure we uh, bring down unemployment and we want to make sure that we protect the most vulnerable people and poverty. And, but they don't really propose any measures to do that. And if you look into their intermediate plan, they're talking about reducing the, the deficit and um, reducing uh, and, and tightening uh, monetary policy. The only positive thing I can see in there is that they, they want to let the exchange rate, uh, the currency, fall, which would be good uh, for the, the country. And uh, I think that's, that's one point where they're, they're right. The problem is, of course, that when the currency depreciates, you get a certain amount of inflation from that. It's not necessarily that much. But then the IMF is going to come and say, OK, we have to do other bad things to shrink the economy in order to lower inflation. And the same is true. They want to get rid of a lot of the subsidies to energy and food. So uh, that's probably going to hurt people. And, and not only that, it's going to increase prices. Again, when prices go up, the IMF tends to be over, uh, you know, overly enthusiastic about bringing down inflation, even if it means causing more unemployment. So it doesn't look, again, it doesn't look like they're going to have a good uh, program for, for Tunisia. And I think the government, I hope the government will try to look for other sources of funding. So at the very least, so they could have more bargaining power or uh, try to go around the IMF entirely as, as many other countries have done. You know, unemployment in Tunisia is very high, uh, you know, 18 or 19 percent. And so the government needs to increase that. You know, in theory, in the IMF paper, they say the country needs more public investment, and it needs to increase employment through public investment. They acknowledge that. And uh, they, in fact, criticize the government for not doing enough of that in the past. But then the question is, you know, where are they going to get the money for that? And uh, they could do it. Um, but then the IMF is going to complain about their, their deficits. You know, they're trying to bring down the deficit. So you, you can't have it both ways. I think it's better for both of those countries to run bigger deficits at, in the short run uh, in order, and the short run could be a couple of years, a few years, in order to increase uh, employment. That, I think, is, should be the most important immediate goal. If they sacrifice their economies in order to reduce debt, or in order to uh, bring down their trade or current account deficit, uh, then they're going to end up, you know, stuck like Europe is, in in a, a long recession, and uh, possibly even increasing unemployment. They should look into other possibilities if the IMF conditions are such that they won't allow the economy to recover and employment to recover. Then they should try to think of something else. They can think of ways to reduce their imports, for example, um, so as to lower their need for, for foreign currency. They can also try to put more controls on, on capital, uh, you know, so as to keep more foreign currency in the country. So there are things that governments can do. I mean, Argentina, for example, has not been, you know, they defaulted on their debt uh, 11 years ago. And they haven't really been able to borrow on international markets uh, since then. But they've done very well, you know. They've grown uh, better than most of the, the whole hemisphere. And they've reduced poverty enormously. Uh, and uh, they've, they've done very well without having access to international capital markets. So the idea would be to try and, and I think, move as much as in, in that direction as they can uh, without sacrificing their economy. So I think that in every case I've seen, there are alternatives to the IMF program. It's very rare that a country has, maybe the poorest countries in the world sometimes, 
uh, could be in a situation where they have no choice. Um, but Tunisia is not like that, and, and neither is Egypt. The reason they do it, and they say this very openly, this is our influence. This is how we have influence in the world on these countries. That's how they justify when they go to the Congress and ask for the money. They say this is a very important avenue of influence. And it is. I mean, it's about half the level as it was 10 years ago. And that is one of the reasons why, by the way, the United States has lost so much influence in the world because in the last decade, is because the IMF was their most important avenue of influence in developing countries, more than the military, more than the CIA, more than all their covert operations and their State Department programs. The IMF was the big one because they had a whole creditor's cartel where if you didn't do what the IMF wanted, you didn't get money from the World Bank, the regional banks, the Paris Club, everybody else. And that has broken down enormously. So the IMF and, their, and, and by extension, the U.S. government doesn't have the influence they used to have. And that's why I think these governments should look really hard at these agreements and try very hard to think about alternative uh, sources of financing and other ways to avoid uh, accepting the conditions. The lending is nothing. It's not a lot of money and it's not really high interest. It's not the loans that are going to hurt these countries. It's the conditions that they attach to them. They're afraid. They're afraid that if they uh, take an independent path, that uh, they will, at least in the short run, have to go through a crisis like Argentina did, you know. Um, you know, during the Asian financial crisis of, uh, you know, in the late 90s, Malaysia was the one who refused to go uh, with the IMF, and they used capital controls instead, and they did, you know, probably a little better uh, than the others. So it is possible, but uh, you have to have a government that feels uh, and is strong enough to do it. They have to, first of all, it helps a lot if they have the backing of the people and they can go to the public and say, look, this might hurt a little, but we're doing this so that we don't have to go down the path that these foreigners want uh, and is going to hurt us even more. And if they're trusted, that helps a lot. If they're not, it's harder to do that. Of course, a lot of times you have right-wing governments or neoliberal governments, and they agree with the program, and they're just using the IMF uh, as a way of justifying what they're doing. But you can see it from a politician's point of view. In a given situation, you know, if you go with the IMF, it's going to be bad, but at least you can blame the IMF. Whereas if you decide to go the other path, like the countries that want to leave the Euro, could, could leave the Euro, then you're going to get blamed for anything bad that happens initially. Well, I think it's a good idea because it can help build public support for uh, uh, a debt cancellation if that becomes necessary or becomes the best policy. And that's why they did it in Ecuador. I mean, in Ecuador, it was a promise that the government made, uh, that Correa made when he ran for office. He said that he would establish an independent commission to look at the debt, and he said that if any of the debt was found to be illegally or illegitimately contracted, then they wouldn't pay it. I mean, people shouldn't be responsible to pay public debt that uh, was contracted by a dictatorship or contracted in an illegitimate manner, and the money went out of the country into Swiss bank accounts, and the people didn't uh, benefit uh, from, the, uh, from the debt. Well, the IMF is never going to support any kind of... I wouldn't say never, because there might be some situation where they feel like they have to loan money to the government for, like, political reasons. And if they think it's important enough for Tunisia or Egypt to get a loan, then they'll give them the loan even if they don't do what they say. Um, but in general, the IMF is not going to lend money for a government to have an industrial policy. I've never seen that. In fact, the Treasury, outside of matters in Europe, the Treasury really, U.S. Treasury really runs the IMF, you know, in developing countries. Yeah. And certainly in Egypt and Tunisia, it will be the U.S. Treasury Department making the decisions.